Howdy, y'all, and welcome back to this series here and Playmaker's Corner, but this series being our 2023 fall season previews, where we are going 1A through 5A, looking at all the 11-man teams, taking a look at how they did last year, what seniors were a part of that group, as in the class of 2023, that will no longer be able to contribute to a program this year, and then some of the returning playmakers as well to try and help that program maintain, sustain, or exceed the success from prior years. And then we take a look at their schedule for this fall and project a window of wins and just kind of go from there. So, you know, I, Cody Stauffer, have done 5A, 4A, 3A, 2A. Be sure to check out all of those episodes that have come out, you know, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, for full analysis on all of my teams that I had assigned. Coming out on Monday, you will have Gideon's teams. I believe he had 16 coming up, so stay tuned for that action-packed episode. And then Coach V will take us towards the season here. And yeah, we'll have a great time previewing all these teams. And, you know, let's go ahead and have some fun and talk about my last set of previews here for this season where I talk about some 1A squadads here. The first one being the Estes Park Bobcats, obviously out of Estes Park, Colorado, who, you know, this team rode a very hot 4-0 start to the season, you know, scoring well over 40 points per contest, highlighted by a 50-burger on Denver Christian in a crazy shootout, and then, you know, two 34-pointers to start the season before losing a close one to Highland, 14-6. And then, you know, recapping a three-game win streak, including a big 60-burger on Manuel before losing to Flatirons Academy, just coming out a little flat after, you know, a forfeit win over Sheridan kind of gave them an extended break. And, you know, they that loss to Flatirons Academy cost them a postseason spot. And, you know, at 7-2, and two, they obviously, you know, were able to score with the best of them with one of the best air attacks in 1A, but just narrowly missed the postseason last year. Some of those guys that didn't get a chance to show their chops in playoff football were the likes of Michael McCown, who is second on the team in yards, receptions, and scores with 657, 43, and 8 in this high-octane passing offense. The Bobcats didn't have the most established rushing attack last year, but Travis Hauser ran for 192 and a pair of scores as the primary tailback, but was you know versatile, which you need to be in this offense with 147 receiving yards and another score. And, you know, he was a two-way force, just like McCown. Both these guys having over 45 tackles on defense. You know, Travis led the team at 52. McCown had seven tackles for loss, which was good enough for second best on the squad, you know, with that total tackle number as well. But, you know, defensively, they are returning, you know, eight non-seniors of the top 11 tacklers from last year. You know, there are a few sophomores interwoven through there, like a Logan Smith, a Cameron Glover, a Jack Stegeman, all of those combining for 53 tackles and a pair of interceptions. Santiago Salgado was impressive in his sophomore effort with the team's second best seven tackles for loss and easily, you know, the most tackles and tackles for loss in his class of that sophomore batch. Kenny Cromer leads the Bobcats pass rush, you know, after last year, you know, leading them in sacks and then also recording 36 tackles and five of those for loss. Calvin Larson was the kingpin of TFLs on this defense with eight for a team high and makes up for a little under a third of the returning total tackles for loss. He also had the likes of Jose Gonzalez, who is a notorious playmaker in 1A, having recorded three interceptions, forced three fumbles, recovered three fumbles, and be one of only two players with 50-plus tackles, and, you know, is the only returner to do so. But on offense, that's really where he was beasting up, you know, having caught 11 touchdowns, and one of the longest plays of the entire Colorado football season with a 94-yard receiving score that made up for, you know, basically a ninth of his 903 total yards. And, you know, he also gets his quarterback back, Ryland Reitz, who had two interceptions on defense, but was really the locomotive behind this offense, completing 67% of his passes 
and leading 1A in passing scores with 31 and accounting for 2,700 yards. He also kept it to himself for two more scores on the ground and could definitely, you know, be an end of the year candidate two seasons in a row for that offensive playmaker of the year or most valuable playmaker. Definitely in that conversation and definitely, you know, a all playmaker kind of guy. So let's go ahead and take a look at their schedule for this upcoming fall season and make sure that they even have, you know, the full slate ready to go here at nine, which they do exact same as last year, probably just flipping what's home and away. They start off with a home game against Wellington that I think is going to be way more competitive than that 34 to 14 game last season. They have some great athletes that are going to challenge Ryland, you know, like a cash on that defensive side. So he's got to be smart with the football. But overall, I think that this defense will still probably be a bit much for this Wellington offense. And I would say very similarly of Middle Park, Denver Christian, and Ellicott, you know, I think that the defense is really going to have to, you know, pull a little bit more weight this year, but, you know, returns plenty of guys that can do exactly that. They should have another 4-0 start here before they do play Highland once again in Alt, Colorado, that unique little town that's just... I want to say just like northeast of Greeley, maybe just straight up north. But, you know, this team that they lost to last year, I don't think that they should have lost this game. If I'm being 100% honest, I think that this is one that they really wish they had back. And this is a team that was very young last year, so they're going to push them again this year. So, you know, they need, this is a must-win game, I would say, if they want to make the playoffs. But I'm not going to say it's a guarantee because they were able to, Highland that is, was able to win this one while being even younger than last year. Pinnacle, they should be able to run away with. But I think that the new unique challenge from this year is going to be Manuel, who I think is going to be significantly improved. Simon is very, very high on this Manuel team. Last year, you know, they were able to score 30 points against Estes, but their defense was just a bit more on the poorest side. But, you know, they closed the the season with wins over Pinnacle and Highland to finish above 500. And, you know, this game for Estes is going to be in Denver. So Manuel has some advantages here, and Estes is going to have to play a really good game here, but this is a losable one. I don't think Sheridan's a losable game, honestly. I think that they should definitely win that. And then Flatirons Academy was the, you know, last seed in the postseason last year. They obviously beat up on Estes Park, for that chance at making the postseason, but they do lose Nolan Shepard, who was, you know, the heartbeat of this offense, as well as Devin Glowicki here. So I think that they could, they should win this game as well. So I will say at bare minimum, even if they lose the three games that, you know, against some of the better teams, they should still win six. But I really think to make the postseason, you gotta win eight. I say that they're allowed to drop one of those, so I'll give them a window of wins of six to eight, and I'm going to have faith in them to pull off an eight and one season and try and get a decent seed in the playoffs on the heels of a lot of returning playmakers on defense and then an offense that will continue to do its thing. We're going to keep talking about the parks here, but this time we're going to go to Granby, Colorado and talk about Middle Park here. You know, we get to see a lot of uh, scenic views to start this episode as far as imaginatively with uh, Estes and Middle Park here in Granby. But, you know, they stumbled out the gate last year, uh, losing three games in a row at one point, dropping to one and three before, you know, winning two, losing one, winning two. So just up and down. But I think that they just show how big the gap really is in the state between teams that are just bad versus programs that are borderline disgraceful. And, uh, you know, they rode those cupcake squads to a solid record, you know, Denver Christian, Jefferson, Clear Creek, take care of business there. Pinnacle, who arguably had one of their better years, they got a win against those guys. But, you know, then facing off against, like, an Arvada that's 2A, a Steamboat that's 2A, just to try and get games scheduled. And then a great program in Strasburg that's going to pose some serious challenges for this squad here. But some of the guys who contributed last year were the likes of Forrest Schofield, who is the starting quarterback and uh, no underclassmen through any passes. So that is the main thing of note there. Xavier Martinez ran for 439 yards and six scores while 
also notching another century through the air. But with another nearly 400 return yards, Xavier here was the only was only two yards shy of a thousand yard season and was the leading yard gatherer for this team. Micah Byram operated in basically the opposite way for 321, 321 receiving yards and 183 rushing yards for a total of five scores. So between those two, you're losing about 11 touchdowns. And then these same two studs of Byram and Martinez were also the leading tacklers on the team, combining for 104 and three tackles for loss. Martinez going crazy or brazy with five interceptions and two fumble recoveries with plenty of turnovers to just set himself up to score on offense. And then that is if Byram hadn't forced four total turnovers himself with a few fumble recoveries. So great playmakers that impacted special teams, offense, defense. You can't really ask for too much more. Now, some of the returning playmakers for Middle Park here includes Marquise Pasillas, who is second on the team with two interceptions and, you know, returning to make an impact in the pass defense is rising seniors Tanner Schnur and Garrett Gillist, both of those guys going for 38 and 47 tackles, respectively. Eli Brody is an impact junior from last season who up front, along with Caden Ackerman, held it down. Brody leading in sacks with two and also in tackles for loss at five, and then Ackerman not being that far behind with sole possession of four tackles for loss and second place. Outside of the top two tacklers from last season that I talked about in the prior segment, you know, they will return the next five leaders who are all juniors and had 12 tackles for loss and over 190 total tackles combined amongst those five. Pasillas was also given freedom to play make on offense, having been in on the most scores last year with eight total between rushing for five and catching three. Lewis Conger actually led the team in carries last season and will try and be the premier back, just getting a bit more efficient, carrying the Rock 64 times for 395 yards and three scores. And then Tanner Schnur also ran for another few scores and 200 yards. So looking ahead to this season, Pinnacle, I think that they're a team that's taking a step back, so I think that they could start off 1-0 and again before, I think, unfortunately, dropping to Estes, Steamboat, and Arvada, all who have great playmakers there. And then I think that they can still beat Denver Christian and Jefferson for another two wins there. They will not beat Strasburg. I just don't see a universe where that happens. And then Platte Canyon and Clear Creek, maybe they split these games. Maybe they win both is kind of the expectation here. So honestly, honestly, they should still win, I should say, four games at bare minimum this year. But, you know, I don't really think that their window is higher than six wins, even if everything goes right. I'm probably just going to call for a four and five season, honestly but wouldn't be surprised at five and four as notated by my window of wins for the middle park Panthers. And next up we have the pinnacle who, you know, I kind of railed on a little bit last year, maybe too, you know, too far of an extreme, but you know, I think that they pulled it together a little bit last year, winning two games strike, you know, destroying a very long losing streak One of those was a forfeit win over Sheridan, to be fair, but their win over Clear Creek was very decisive and dominant, I would say. And, you know, they played in some entertaining games, like their one-point loss to Manuel in a 42-41 crazy shootout. So, you know, I think that this was primarily thanks to Noah Estes and, you know, who is an All-State Honorable Mention fella um, in his efforts in beating Clear Creek. And, you know, the aforementioned beast Noah Estes graduates after a 200-carry season that saw him almost reach 1,600 yards and eight scores while also leading the Wolves in receiving and tackles on defense with 77 total and four for loss. You know, he really willed this team to even move the football, honestly, in what was otherwise a pretty forgetful season. Then they will also be losing Josiah Mendoza, who is second on the team in total tackles at 58 and had a tackle for loss while tying for the team lead of three sacks. Alonzo Aguirre was the only other senior with a single tackle for loss of his 38 total tackles. But once you throw in that Jose Mata and Alejandro Rutiaga were both seniors just below Alonzo in total tackles, this is starting to really add up to a lot of tacklers that aren't coming back. And, you know, Robert McClinton... He paced the squad in interceptions with three while batting down another two passes to take up the majority of the turnovers, only accompanied by Jose Mata's lone pick. And 11 of the 16 total 
players. Not top 16. 11 of the 16 total players for the Timberwolves that had tackles were seniors. That includes Noah Martinez, uh, you know, who is modest with 25 tackles on defense, but, uh, you know, was also the starting quarterback last season, rushing for 223 yards and throwing for another 100 and going for four scores. So they are graduating the majority of this entire football team is what that says to me, which is kind of scary. And I hope that they can field a team this season. So, you know, but they do have some guys that are coming back that did play last year. So, you know, let's try and build up some hope there. I think that the most noteworthy playmaker was Yadir Perez, who as a freshman broke 100 yards and the plane just once on an otherwise very depleted offense. He also had Alfredo Zamudio Moctezuma, who is tied for the team lead with fellow junior Jacob Madrid at three sacks. And those two juniors combined for 83 total tackles. Perez, you know, Yadir was also accompanied by Humberto Chavez as the only freshman to notch tackles with 48 total tackles. But looking at this roster, it seems hard to contemplate this team having a team to play with the upcoming fall season based off of last year's senior numbers. And should they play, they might just lose every single game. I hate to just be like a negative Nancy here, but the outlook is not great, especially when you play teams like you know, Estes, Flatirons, Highland, Manual, those are all, you know, big games. But, you know, I think that if they benefit from a forfeit against Sheridan, then uh, another one against Clear Creek or something like that, they could win up to two. So I'm going to say a window of wins of zero to two. But, you know, if somebody else fields a team, I think that they're going to lose. So I'll say one and eight slash oh and nine for my more specific predictions sorry pinnacle but i mean this just looks really rough unless they get a transfer in or a secret weapon in that freshman class that is just an all-state kind of guy it's going to be a tough season now this episode is finna turn up here with a honestly a contender here talking about strasburg football always just such a hoot to you know evaluate and you know get ready to watch play some ball after you know last year having a very solid season you know they had a very strong senior class help them win some iconic games like their double overtime 1 a.m win over wiggins and their dominant destructions of burlington and centauri in the postseason but you know there were some low lights like their two losses were both uh shutouts to Lyman in the regular season and Ray in the postseason. And some of those seniors that I think kind of joined that lore, that long, great history of fantastic Lyman players includes the likes of Zach Marrero, probably one of the most talented players in 1A since he became a starter. And this season, this past season was no different as he rushed for 1,681 yards and a blockbuster total of 27 touchdowns while also being a threat out of the backfield, having scored four times in that facet as well. And then on defense, being an impact guy, 53 tackles were fourth best while also recovering a pair of fumbles. Hayden Turner was a threat to score in more ways than one, as evidenced by his punt return for a touchdown, two pick sixes, and three offensive touchdowns for the fourth best TD total last season, and intercepting the opponent four times was best marks on the squad. Egan Stevens was second on the team in solo tackles and blew up run plays four times himself while also paving open rushing lanes on the offensive side. And then Zachary Rushman was the answer over the middle with a team-high 71 tackles and second-best nine tackles for loss. Dalton Bergstrom was a disruptive defender with three pass deflections and a bevy of tackles to boot. Now, Caleb Hart's stats won't jump off the page, but limited action hurt this team that could have used his athletic dimension that won't even be an option this season after having played basically every position on offense in the past. But not to worry, there are plenty of returning playmakers here. You know, looking at even the young guys like a Makai Savorin, who, you know, as a freshman forced three fumbles and recovered one while also getting an interception. I'm talking about DJ Cannon, who I think will be integral to both the offensive and defensive success 
in the trenches for his senior year. And to an even higher degree, Al Dickens here, absolute monster, recording seven sacks, 16 tackles for loss, and 60 tackles while, once again, flipping it over to the offensive side and, you know, serving pancakes like a village inn waiter with, you know, his skills on that dimension of the football. And, you know, while it does obviously stink to lose Marrero out of the backfield, they will return, you know, his running back committee buddy here, Thomas Devlin, who I think will be leaned on as the primary ball carrier next year. You know, after recording, a hun- he had over 100 carries last season, went for 664 yards and 12 touchdowns. So by all means, very solid production. And I think that both of those, or all three of those categories will take pretty significant jumps behind, you know, an offensive line that is returning some pieces. And, you know, obviously with his experience at tailback, I think that both of those are important as well. But, you know, I think that's something that made Strasburg so dangerous last year and something that's going to make them dangerous this year is their ability to be a balanced offense, not having to lean on just run or just pass here. And the passing game will be healthy here. You know, Austin Velasco was both the top target on offense for his team and one of the top targets for opponents where he burnt opposing teams for four interceptions and a whopping 222 return yards and three scores. So this dude was scoring a ton of touchdowns on the defensive side, but then also gave, you know, Landon Martin a security blanket in the passing game, recording 28 catches for 564 yards and six touchdowns. So honestly, just a threat to score at will honestly whether it's on the offensive or defensive side of the ball has a nice frame good reach and wingspan that he could definitely use to just box out some smaller corners and stuff like that and you might have heard a name in there that was dotting up austin and you know under center is one of the top quarterbacks in 1a absurd 112.4 passer rating last season throwing 12 scores to just two picks and eclipsing a thousand yards That is Landon Martin here, who, like I said, was just very dominant and very clean. You know, he had great performances getting the ball to his playmakers in space, as well as, you know, being patient and occasionally, you know, just making the smart play sometimes, just running out of bounds or throwing the ball away, showing a lot of maturity, you know, in this junior year of his that I think will only continue to benefit him senior year as he's just given more responsibilities and more opportunities I should say to make plays at the quarterback position but you know I think that the main you know appetite for him is that you know his his cousin Walker had one state at Eaton I believe his older brother Connor has one state at Strasburg and I think that he just wants to bring it home as the youngest Martin to win state his senior year But what will that road look like? Well, let's take a look at this upcoming season. You know, last year, obviously, they made it to week 12 as far as games go. And, you know, this year they would like to make it even a little further. But they will have a great challenge right out the gate. Holyoke is a team that was very junior heavy last year and even sophomore heavy. And I think will have made significant strides and will be way more of a challenge for Strasburg this year. It is on the road. It is going to be difficult, but I'm not saying it's not a winnable game. They then have Wiggins on the road. They should honestly take care of business here. Wiggins graduated the majority of their historic players from the past four years just this most recent spring. So Strasburg definitely should get a win here. Lyman, this is the team that you have to beat if you want to be proven as a legitimate stead at threat at state and getting blanked by them isn't going to accomplish that Lyman is still going to be good I honestly am projecting a win for Lyman that is going to be playing at home with you know one of the best linemen in all of classifications you know more on that later but you know if Strasburg really wants to make a statement they gotta 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 beat this team here then they have Bennett at home honestly I trust Strasburg to take care of business against Bennett here Clear Creek, Denver Christian, Middle Park, Jefferson, Platte Canyon. I'm not even going to bother going through those. The the true tests of this schedule are the non-league games, in my opinion. I think at worst, this team definitely wins six games. I think that any less than six is kind of inexcusable. 
and you know at you know most i'd say i'm gonna give them a window of wins of six to eight here but i'm gonna project them to go seven and two overall you know with i'm guessing losses to holyoke and lyman i think that those are the only two losses that are quote excusable if one might with all the talent that they have up front with the high-end players that continue to make plays and some of the young players that are going to try and make bigger impacts this coming season. There's plenty to be excited about for Strasburg. But I'd say that the only other two teams where there's plenty of excitement is Holyoke and Lyman. Both of those games on the road also definitely plays a factor in my evaluation of them. But if you can split those games, you'll be in a really good spot to draw some good seeding here for the postseason, which is really what Strasburg is playing for. Obviously, got to get sharp in the regular season, but the postseason and state is the name of the game here out east. Now, we're going to dial it a step back here and actually transition into this 1A League 4, probably the most difficult league of the past few years in Colorado football, if I'm being completely honest. One that literally sent every team from league into the postseason last year, but Kind of strangely, that also included Burlington here, who by no means was terrible. You know, I think that they felt a lot more competitive, but it just wasn't reflected in the wins column. They have a close loss to 2A, La Hunta, and Elizabeth. So, you know, that's tough. They do get two wins. They finally get into that win column against Goodland, which is a team from Kansas. We always love beating teams out of state. Take that. And then, you know, getting a win against Lamar before in league play, Losing to Lyman by 29, Yuma by 11, Wiggins by 28, Ray by 20, Holyoke by 21. But with those score gaps and the strength of schedule, that was considered enough for Burlington to make it in here where they would lose to Strasburg to start the playoffs here. Now, some of the guys or contributors from last year, Garrett Richardson is probably the big one here who did a little bit of anything and a little bit less of passing from the last year as opposed to you know being used to catch the ball 14 times for almost 300 yards and scores and then was the leading rusher in total yards average and touchdowns with 464 5.7 average and seven rushing touchdowns absolute beast and then you know burlington or you know richardson had a half a thousand passing yards as well then you look at some of the other playmakers like Dominic Conradi, who is third on the team with 331 rushing yards and three scores, and caught for another 229, so over 500 yards of total offense. And then Logan Boyd, who had, you know, a ton of all-purpose yards, catching for 451 and five scores, but having another 400 yards on kickoff punt and interception returns. And so between Richardson, Conradi, and Boyd, Burlington will be tasked with replacing 2,244 yards plus you know, that uh, half a thousand of passing yards. So like 2,700 total yards of offense is just gone. The same trio were also responsible for 188 total tackles, four and a half sacks, five interceptions, and a ludicrous 23 tackles for loss, mainly highlighted by Dominic Conradi, who had 21. Boyd highlighting the interceptions with three, Richardson two. And then Conradi and Rich being the sack artists. So they all kind of like, plugged and played in different aspects all making moves here and then this is including the 12 pass deflections on dom and garrett's shoulders so you know they had their secondary playmakers they got in the backfield they were making tackles for loss they were playing the field sideline to sideline they were scoring touchdowns i just don't know what more you could want from these three guys and you know who's going to replace them is a very alarming question honestly because a lot of those a lot of the success that the Cougars had ran through those three seniors primarily, but you know, some juniors did see opportunities this season, like leading tackler, Matthew Gutierrez, who had 60 solos and 98 total tackles and notched two INTs. Rodolfo Estrada Acosta had a pick and two pass breakups while forcing a fumble his junior season. Angel Vela was the leading pass rusher with six sacks. So that's really nice to have that back and double-digit hurries to go with his double-digit TFLs that were second-best on the team and the most by any non-senior. So Angel Vela, probably going to be, you know, the premier defensive presence for this Burlington squad. 
Trenton Smith was also doing work in the trenches with 42 tackles and three and a half of those being for loss. Tyson Janicek was amongst the leaders in forced fumbles with two and broke up a pass to go with his six and a half tackles for loss this past season. Sophomore Stanton Cure was certainly a remedy of some kind eh? with uh, five and a half tackles for loss. And then Angel Vela was also responsible for over a thousand scrimmage yards, leading the team in passing at 716 and rushing for another 367 with seven total scores, but also through seven interceptions. So honestly, we are still having playmakers, mainly on the defensive side of the ball, and then Angel Vela being tasked with the majority of the responsibility on whether this team is going to be good or not. So if I recall correctly, or at least the last time that I looked at it, they had not quite finished rounding out their schedule for last year, or I mean for this coming season. So looking ahead to the games that they do have, they do have La Hunta, Elizabeth, Goodland, Lamar. So we'll assume that those are their non-league games, and then we know who's in their league, luckily. So, you know, I think that La Hunta is still going to be solid this year. I think that they dealt with some injuries down the stretch last year that made people forget how good of a program they were. So I'm going to give the edge to La Hunta. I'm going to give the edge to Elizabeth Goodland. I mean, that was a team that they beat last year, you know, convincingly, I should say. And so that's a team that I have faith in them beating for this upcoming season with the returners that they do have. So that's my take on their game against Goodland. And then Lamar, you know, they still should probably be able to beat the Rolling Fender. They held them to zero points last year, and they have guys that can help them pitch a shutout again this year. Lyman, you know, I think that that's a game that they probably don't win, if I'm being completely honest. But, you know, against Yuma, I think that they have a chance. They they played them pretty close last year, and Yuma has less returning playmakers than Burlington. So Burlington might actually win that game now that I kind of look at it a little bit deeper. And I think that they might be able to beat Wiggins, potentially, who just graduates a ton of contributors here. Um, like an alarming amount of contributors that they'll have to replace. They don't beat Ray and they don't beat Holyoke. I just do not. There's no way. There's no way, honestly. So the window of wins for this Burlington team, I think that they should probably win at least. I'll say that they should win at least three games. I got to be completely honest. Even with those high-end contributors leaving, there's still plenty of talent here. I think that they should win at least three games, so they should be better than last year. And I honestly think that on the high end, this could be a five-win team. I think that five and four is actually a pretty fun record to predict for Burlington here. And, you know, they might, I feel like, might deservingly more so deserve a playoff spot this upcoming season. Because I just think losing all your games in league and making the playoffs is crazy to me, bro. Like, so if they can actually win a league game, that would go a long way to me feeling a bit better about them. But, you know, I'm actually going to be just a little bit safer and say four to five, uh, four and five overall record for the Burlington football team. Now, arguably the best mascot in all of Colorado football, or at least in 1A, the Holyoke Dragons are up next here. And last season was a roller coaster, losing a few, winning a few, losing a few, but was highlighted, I'd say, by out-of-state wins over Colby and Hershey, and an upset win over Yuma that helped them make the playoffs, in which they lost by one score to a very good Monte Vista team, who I believe was undefeated at the time. You know, And it was going to take a ton of sophomores doing the most this season to compete last year, but I said last year in their season preview that they would be way more ready to compete this season because the only seniors who appeared to literally do anything was Angel Carrasco and Jaden Frost, two of them combining for 43 tackles and one for loss. Otherwise, the returning playmakers are nuts. The easier question is, who isn't coming back since the top 10 tacklers all return, and a lot of those playmakers were two-way beasts. Starting off with Wyatt Sprague, who was the leading tackler at 75 total tackles, tied for the most interceptions at two, five pass deflections, and is a great start for, you know, the age of Dragon here. And, you know, was also the starting quarterback for this team. 
conducting a steady unit, honestly, and, you know, showing improvement from his, I, I want to say, from his sophomore year to his junior year, showing the ability to make better decisions, almost throwing for 2,000 yards, throwing for 21 scores, and his completion percentage should only go up with more work here. Tyson Mosentine was second on the team with 74 tackles, so only one less than Wyatt, while forcing two fumbles in that batch of tackles. And, you know, one of those might have came from his team high four sacks and five hurries that led to interceptions in the secondary. You know, talking about those interceptions, I mentioned that Wyatt had some, but Cash Weber, you know, had an interception while also leading the team in pass deflections with nine Bryson Dirks was another impact guy I talked about last season who broke the 50 tackle mark while recovering a fumble, picking off a pass, and breaking up four more pass attempts. So very solid secondary here. And then, you know, just narrowly behind Tyson in total tackles and sacks was Reed Sprague, who had three sacks and 50 total tackles last season while matching his brother and freshman Colby Weber with two interceptions. So Lots of interceptions coming back to the fold as well for this Holyoke defense. The defensive and offensive lines appeared to have been comp comprised of at least four seniors of Irving Dominguez, rising seniors that is, Irving Dominguez, Carson Hine, Luke Roberts, and Cody Maloney, who defensively accounted for 160 tackles, two for loss, and then also opened up rushing lanes with another sophomore and Hunter Vermulin. For this offense's 721 total rush yards that all return plenty of experience together and it's time to put on size and the time that they have to put on size, I should say, should only make this line unit more fierce that surprisingly, for the most part, has like two seasons together. Um, offense is the same names, but with different numbers. Wyatt delivering to Cash Weber for 762 yards, eight touchdowns on 50 catches. Dirks's dimes dropping him for 460 yards and four scores. Reed Sprague catching from his older brother 21 times for 310 yards and three scores. And then the versatile running back Tyson Moss and Teens, 618 total scrimmage yards, leading to a total of eight scores with an even split in the air and on the ground here. Wyatt, on top of those 21 passing scores that he had as this team's quarterback, also had another five rushing scores and, you know, wasn't the most efficient in yards per carry, but I think that that will take a very steep uptick with all of the returners that are coming back, you know, from uh, specifically on the offensive line, that is. And I think that there's a lot to be excited about for this Holyoke team that, no way do they actually have all nine up here. They do have all nine up here, and they got to avenge some of these losses from last year. I mean, just looking at last year, you know, big 31-point loss to Strasburg. They also lose to, you know, the eventual uh, eight-man runner-ups in Haxton. But, you know, it's still a little weird for, um, you know, I'd say a team like Holyoke to lose an 18-point game to an eight-man squad. Um, but you know, Haxton, obviously a model of success. I don't want to disrespect them. Uh, it's just kind of weird with 11 person losing to eight, but you know, they're out of state games. They fared well, like I said, beating Colby and Hershey last year by, you know, formidable amounts. And then in league just only was able to beat Yuma, like I said, in an upset and then Burlington. So looking ahead to this year, they got to flip the script and I think that they will be significantly better. They get Strasburg at home with all of these returners. Like I said, Strasburg could definitely win this game, but I am leaning Holyoke. They then have Haxton on the road. I feel like you got to win this game. Haxton with enough turnover. They really, they should win this game. They should be 4-0 heading into league, in my opinion. But there is a world where they enter league at 2-2 two two once again. Now, Ray, that's going to be a really tough matchup because Ray just obviously was the runner-ups in 1A, and I can't wait to talk about them here in a second. But, you know, I think that they are graduating some very, very good talent. I think of, like, Tell Wade, who won't be back, and their returning playmakers is a bit more on the shallow side. I think that Ray might take a little bit of a dip back here. Still going to be a playoff team. You'll hear why in a bit. But I think that this is a game that Holyoke should win, but it's on the road, so if Ray wins it, no big deal. 
Wiggins, they absolutely should beat Wiggins this year. I think that they should absolutely, you know, beat Yuma at home. They have them at home this year. I don't really think there's an excuse to lose that game. And then Burlington on the road, I think will be an interesting matchup. But if they are rolling the way that they should be rolling by this point, that that should be a win. But their big challenges, Lyman, Ray, Strasburg, and I'd even say Haxton, all games that they lost last year and really need to get back this next season. If they're going to be, I think that this is a state contending team. I honestly really think that, but they're going to have to win these games to prove that. I think bare minimum, bare minimum, they win five games. I think that that's no question that they improve from last year in their win total of four. But, you know, I think that they should be closer to an eight win team. Honestly, I'm going to project them to be five and eight. And honestly, I'm going to project them to be an eight and one football team with their only loss coming to the team that we'll talk about next. But for now, the eight and one projected five to eight window of win Holyoke Dragons looking to actually make some noise this year, both in the regular season, as well as hopefully make a very deep run in the postseason with a team that has been just getting cohesively better over the past two seasons and now enters a very large senior class for this coming fall. But the next team I'm talking about here is Lyman that was back to being title town last year. They didn't lose a single game this past season, even though they were probably the most battle tested team having only played playoff teams all year and really only be looking in trouble in the championship game before an electrifying second half brought the chip back. Now, as far as graduated seniors go, the 1A Player of the Year and Playmaker of the Year, Gabe Schubarth, graduates after seeing plenty of action over his storied career. And just a year after a disappointing championship display, he picked it up and took over when he needed to, you know, secure the title while leading the Badgers in carries, yards, and touchdowns at 205, 1,590, and 22 in that original listed order. So plenty of things to you know congratulate Shubarth on in a very storied career. Michael Hoffman and Dontarius Arnold were both solid targets in the past game their senior year, combining for 26 catches, 385 yards, and seven receiving scores, spearheaded by Hoffman, Hoffman's five in a very play-action-heavy pass system. But Arnold, not to be outdone, led the team in interceptions with two, while Hoffman added another one himself on the defensive side of the ball. And these guys had 36 and 42 tackles, respectively, and a combined three TFLs. Schubarth was also essential to this defense's success with 80 total tackles, six and a half of those in the backfield, and notching an interception. They also will be losing Miguel Nunez, who is responsible for five and a half tackles for loss last year. And then Jafe Faust was probably the last notable senior of tackles for loss at three. And then Caden Becker was dominant at his offensive line position. You know, very rarely, if ever, losing matchups and being a pillar of stability for this offense that got to operate on its own time and pace this past season through that very brutalizing line. So when I talk about losing a player of the year, when I talk about losing touchdowns, when I talk about losing very solid anchors on the line in TFLs, why am I still so confident in the Lyman Badgers other than their Lyman? Well, they got the returning playmakers to back it up, honestly, because taking handoffs this year will be a combination of Logan Botger and Keon Bandy, who both got to score in multiples of seven last year, often, and uh, Logan reaching 886 yards. Congrats to Logan, by the way, for that offer to Western real quick. That's our guy out there, even though I am pretty sure I mess up your name every time I say your last name. But, you know, you know, it's all love on here. And, uh, you know, he uses his speed very well to aim for the edge. And then Keon just does a great job of falling forward for first downs. Now, handing the ball off and playing an efficient game under center was Jordan Rockwell, 1,250 yards, 16 scores on 66% completion, and is a player who have more, who might have more liberty slash freedom next year to open up the offense a little bit more and just show a little bit more of a dynamic angle. Lance Beattie was the leading pass catcher with 16 receptions for 230 yards and two scores, 
but Bandy and Logan got in on the action with three and one receiving scores respectively. Bandy Bayer and Rockwell were stalwarts in the pass defense with two, one, and three interceptions in that order, and Logan leading that group with three fumble recoveries as well and notching 59 tackles and six and a half of those wrap-ups being in the backfield. Keon Bandy was a great presence in the middle and was irreplaceable with over 100 total tackles and seven and a half in the backfield. Now, if you have a familiar name here, it's because it definitely is. Aaron Shubarth recorded 7.5 of his 62 total tackles behind the line of scrimmage and was second on the team with sacks, you know, definitely being a very high level defensive impact player, maybe somebody that, like his brother, we might see on offense from time to time as well, since basically all of these guys can play every position on the field, which is a huge testament to, you know, the coaching staff there for the Badgers. I digress a little bit though. Sophomore Tuck Hubbard found ball carriers for a loss three times, so, you know, he'll be entering his junior year. But the scariest player of them all, I wish I had like lightning sound effects who, you know, in this entire program would have to be Trayton Marks, who not only muscled people on offense and kept his quarterback's pocket clean, creating, you know, entire highway lanes for running backs to drive through, but he ravaged other teams' space and pockets with a team high in sacks, 11, three forced fumbles, 108 tackles, and tackles for loss with 22.5 being honestly one of the most impressive individuals, you know, in all of Colorado football. And it's probably the most overlooked prospect that, you know, is, you know, being evaluated at all. So trademarks, definitely an MVP candidate. I'm just going to call it now an MVP candidate play, uh, caliber player, I should say. Looking at their schedule next year, it's going to be difficult. You know, I think that there's no you know, dancing around that, but Lyman, they're here for all the smoke, honestly. They currently, non-league games, have scheduled Meeker, Strasburg, and Buena Vista, and if we are to look at their last year's schedule, you know, obviously including the league games, such as Array, a Holyoke, and stuff like that, they had Florence, which is a 2A squad. I think that they beat down Florence. I think that they beat down Meeker. Strasburg, like I said, this is... This is Lyman's game to lose. It's at home. And then Buena Vista, I don't think they're just going to be quite the same this season. So I think that, once again, I want to say that that game is at home now that I kind of think about it for Lyman uh, this season, especially because usually the schedule is just flipped. You know, it's the same thing for two years and then just gets kind of rock and rolled over. And as it stands, it is currently listed as a home game as well, which is huge for Lyman that's just such a far and tough place to play and a place, you know, where their fans really like to get into it. That's their pride and joy, is that uh, Badger football team. So, you know, I think that non-league, 4-0, at worst 3-1, and if they lose to Strasburg at home, I think that's their only lose a bowl game. Then Burlington, I think that they should win that one. That's at home. Ray, away at Ray, is going to be one of their tougher games, along with Holyoke on the road. But they should finish with wins over Wiggins and Yuma, in my opinion. So, at worst, they win six games, but they probably go nine and zero. Um, so, window of wins of six to nine, nice, and a projected record of nine and zero. It's like until until they do lose, I'm not gonna bet against them. I just think that would be, I think that's foolish. So, the Lyman Badgers currently projected nine and zero. But watch out for Holyoke and Ray to be their big challenges in league. Now, speaking of Wiggins here, let's go ahead and talk about what happened last year for the Tigers. You know, this most recent season was very similar to the one prior with just a few losses, like losing to Strasburg in double overtime, losing to Yuma by three instead of winning by one the previous year. Beating Ray in the finale really made me hopeful, the regular season finale it is, that is for their title hopes before losing to Ray in the second round in just an absolute heartbreaking way as Ray, you know, rattled off an absurd comeback that, you know, concludes some Wiggins legends stories. Very unfortunate, but you know, let's celebrate some of these players right now and just talk about, you know, how important they were and some of their career accolades, such as the 
guy responsible for 58 passing touchdowns, 44 rushing touchdowns, over 8,000 yards of offense, six interceptions, and 200 tackles in his career. That's the kind of stat line that Cole Kerr could do over a career that saw him only get bigger, stronger, smarter, better, win a handful of Playmaker of the Weeks, be an end-of-the-year candidate, and stake his claim in the history books as one of the best Tigers to ever do it. I'm not sure if he's playing on the next level, but he definitely should. And, you know, if it wasn't such a deep quarterback class this past year, definitely could have been a top five senior candidate. Another guy who was an important senior for a handful of years, or these two guys, was Omar Perez and Trey Fasiki. They were the two top targeted receivers. They combined for over 1,000 yards and 11 scores. Omar with his speed, Trey with his size, and, you know, I mean, if a quarterback's going to throw for a ton of yards, somebody's got to catch a ton of yards, right? But this offense was really balanced as well. You know, Julio Flores ran for 1,490 yards and 19 scores, sometimes even being the focal point of the offense, taking over games at times, and keeping the Tigers within striking distance throughout the entire season. Now, not only were Kerr and Flores two-way guys, but two-way top four tacklers, and in Kerr's case, the leading interceptor with three while also forcing and recovering a fumble. And then Flores' stance was the second leading sacker, which was his primary, you know, calling there. And then the only players to tie or be ahead of Julio in sacks was Laith Ibrahim, also a senior, and Pepper Rusher, who had four and six respectively, but were also the leaders of tackles, period, on the squad and will be missed for their pushes up front. Pepper Rusher, a defensive playmaker of the year winner before. Uh, Laith being a fantastic force on both sides of the ball, being very versatile. All those guys are legends in our eyes, and I'm really glad that I got to cover the majority of their careers, especially post-COVID. And both the all of these cats, I think, are college-level talent. I'm not sure what their next step is or what it has been, but you know, if you're Wiggins, and you have these guys that have been starting since their sophomore or even freshman year. Basically, all of these guys seeing some time freshman year, but especially seeing heavy time by the time that they were sophomores, just because that's a very special group. This is a very special class of 2023, and one that's going to be quite the headache to replace. Some of the guys that are going to try and make that possible include Tyler Dilka, Jorge Mendez, and Jason Luberg who are three sophomores who all broke 100 yards and the plane last season and must figure out between the three of them how to replace 31 rushing touchdowns from last season. Woo! Junior Meyer was the leading tackler amongst underclassmen with 35 and also recorded a pick. But, you know, I think that's something that's going to be exciting to look forward to is the six foot four, 260 260-pound Americo Lorenzini, who will be tasked with the heavy weight of replacing rusher after being the leading tackler of this incoming senior class. Now, talking about the window of wins with more or less the same three players being critical to Wiggins' success over the past three seasons, I assume that there will be a bumpy road ahead, and they might have to struggle to compete in league since we here at PMC have not witnessed Wiggins without Kerr, without Perez, without Rusher. So we'll see what they're able to do in a reloaded season. But like I said, this might be this might be a rough one. And there's no shame in that. But, you know, I think that for a program that's been so used to just dominating, it will be tough. But currently two of their or three of their non-league games are scheduled. They got Strasburg, Rocky Ford, and Platte Valley. If their other non-league game is to reflect last year, that was 2A squad brush, which might have been, you know, just a kind of strength of schedule plea here for, you know, getting a win over the defending state runner-ups at the time. Say they run it back against Brush as well. Brush was pretty senior heavy, so I actually think that you know this should be a good football game and one that Wiggins can win. Strasburg, I just don't see it with the amount of production that's leaving. I think that Strasburg is favored to win that game and probably not in a 1 a.m. double overtime thriller once again. Rocky Ford, they should be able to beat Rocky Ford. Rocky Ford. I don't know how this is still a 118, but they, you know, fun little uh, mascot. Shout out to the Meloneers, but uh, yeah, Wiggins, you should definitely win this game. And then Platte Valley, you know, they had a very weird kind of season beating teams that maybe they shouldn't, but also losing to teams that maybe they 
should not as well. But Howdy Johnson returns, which I think is the important part for Platte Valley, and I think that they probably lose to Platte Valley before in league. I honestly think that Wiggins is probably the punching bag here, and they got to duke it out with Yuma and Burlington to scratch and claw for their only win in league of the season. So, unfortunately for Wiggins, I think that, you know, on the low end, they still win a game. I don't have a doubt about that. But I think that even best case scenario, they maybe win four games. They get wins over maybe a Brush, maybe a Rocky Ford, and then a Burlington and a Yuma. But really, I think that this is going to probably be a 2-7 and seven build back season. And don't get me wrong, teams in this league have been shown to make me eat my words if they're graduating a lot of guys. But, you know, just do it on the field and then I'll, I'll see you recognize you and give you the, the credit and I'll recognize if I was wrong. But for now, uh, just a lot of unproven's and what ifs is kind of my vibe with Wiggins right now. This next team, however, was the runner-ups in state last season. I'm talking about the Ray Eagles, who, you know, last season, they split a pair of out-of-state games, beating Goodland, but losing to Scott City, who is, I, after I talked to the coach of Lyman, one of the most dominant programs in football over there, and, you know, was a playoff team that lost in the second round out in Kansas. So I think that, that is noteworthy to just really quickly mention there but you know they lose that game and then they bounce back with a couple of wins against Ellicott and Holyoke before losing a close one to Lyman and then getting upset by Wiggins I would say in Wiggins to you know end their season but you know Ray has been known these past few seasons for argues for arguably being short and that's where this season it just looked like it was heading when Wiggins had a large lead just for the, in the playoffs, the second round that is, just for the Eagles to storm back and beat Wiggins 35-28, to 28, stomp Strasburg, and then, you know, give Lyman their best struggle that they had had all year before some great Badger adjustments sent Ray home as runner-ups. And this was a very big 2023 contributing class here. You know, Tell Wade is probably the hardest pill to swallow for this team, seeing as how he's a Division One talent that will be playing at Wyoming and was responsible for eight and a half sacks and a team high 19 tackles for loss out of his 78 total tackles. So just constantly being a terrorizer in the backfield was Tell Wade and somebody who lit up quarterbacks too. And, you know, like I said, was a top five 2023 pass rusher according to our evaluations and our scales. So go ahead and find that episode for our top five 23 edge rushers for a full breakdown on Tell Wade. The only player who was amongst the leaders in so many defensive categories, similarly to Tell, was Brady Collins. 94 tackles, second best. 13 and a half tackles for loss, third best. Four sacks, second best. And then forcing a brutalizing four fumbles, big hammer to a nail on the defensive side of the ball. Great wrestler, uses great technique and leverage to just rack up a ton of tackles. Doesn't, if ever, rarely misses tackles, and that's going to be hard to replace. And that doesn't even account for the offensive workload he had, rushing, you know, for 972 yards on 164 carries, and then breaking through the plane, you know, for six points eight different times. Camden Riggleman wiggled his way into the backfield nine and a half times and still finished with 60 total tackles and an absurd five fumble recoveries. Ronnie Shea was just ahead of Riggleman in total tackles at 63, but just under half in TFLs at four. Another piece up front was Jackson Bledsoe, whose size and strength had ball carriers panicked and flattened five times in the backfield or sent to other senior TFL gurus like Caden Bauer at five and a half, Chris Arambula at three and a half, Peyton Wade at two for a senior class that ultimately was responsible for 69 nice tackles for loss which they will be losing to the graduation stage 65% of their total TFLs. Arambula was also heads up with three interceptions and was the leading receiver on the offensive side of the ball with 62 receptions for 568 yards and five scores. The next three leading receivers after him also graduate with over 400 combined yards and four scores. And then Arambula would also run the ball well off of jet sweeps for 359 yards and five scores. Now, 
they are losing a lot, but they are still going to be competitive and they're still going to make the place the make the playoffs in the postseason. And let me tell you why. Because this returning group is headlined by two-year starter Casey Midcap entering his junior season under center. And after having a little bit of a sophomore slump and seeing passes late this last season, he was still able to get the job done with 1,020 yards on 60% completion. But he will be tasked with running this offense with all new receivers and has to make sure to get on the same page as them sooner rather than later this offseason. Sam Meisner was a sophomore monster as well, running for absurdly hard for 19 touchdowns and 892 yards, but then also leading the Eagles in tackles at 138. 17 in those of the backfield, yes, even exceeding Brady Collins. And if you combine that with the intensity to hit and force fumbles, that's a hell of a dude on the defense. Midcap on defense, for his credit, was responsible for three picks. But this team will run through Casey and Sam until they get everyone up to speed. And I would say that looking at the window wins the road to state is a lot more unclear this year, as many of the mainstays of the past four years pass the torch to unknowns in teams across the league and open up opportunities for new guys to step up or other teams to step into the playoff picture. But I would not go that far to say that they're not going to make the playoffs after having just, literally just made state this past season. So if we look at their schedule here, they still have, you know, Goodland as well as Scott City scheduled. They got Highland scheduled as well for a non-league game. This time they'll have a home opener on week one, which is exciting. I think non-league, you go three and one here at, I have worst you go three and one here. There's really no excuse for finishing less than three and one, in my opinion. Before you get to league, I don't know if they beat Holyoke at home, but you know the fact that they have them at home, same with Lyman, gives them a better chance. But I think that they lose those games. Yuma, this one is really gonna be a coin toss. I think that they have just kind of different guys coming back and different teams and systems. I would think that Ray should win this with the quarterback that they're returning, but Yuma could definitely play spoiler here. Before they play Burlington, Burlington, I think, doesn't beat Ray. And then I think that Ray beats Wiggins. So I think if even if the worst nightmare happens here where you lose to Holyoke, Lyman, Yuma all in a row, I still think that you wouldn't lose a fourth one in a row to Burlington. They, maybe they split games between Yuma and Burlington, but that's the worst case scenario for that. Um, and that still puts them at one, two, three, four, five wins which is just kind of nuts, honestly, for their ceiling to be that low with that many players graduating. But, you know, I think that their high end isn't much higher. I just have a really hard time seeing them be Holyoke, Lyman, and Ayuma. I think that they probably lose two out of those three games combined with Scott, um, you know, making four, probably a seven-win season at the most. I just don't see anything above seven and two. That's the ideal spot. But I think that, you know, six and three is, mm, I'm going to go five and four, actually, for my predicted record on record. But don't forget that the window of wins I have listed is five to seven for this former 2022 state runner-ups, Ray Eagles. And last but certainly not least here, Yuma, who last year, despite very important graduates, you know, from that class of 2022, went on to prove me wrong and exceed expectations with a 6-0 start, notable blowout win over Banning Lewis Academy, and a narrow win over Wiggins before losing to Ray and Holyoke by a combined 10 points and then closing with a loss to Lyman and then heating up in the playoffs, beating Rye in the first round before losing a one-point game to a very magical Colorado Springs Christian football team. So, Lots to be happy about in this 7-4 and four showing here with some very notable Class of 2023 contributors. I'm talking about Nash Richardson, who took over as the, quote, QB, you know, end quote, in this system. Definitely more of a wildcat guy. Threw for, you know, a decent, uh, small amount of yards, but also notched 530 yards rushing the ball and seven scores to complement Ethan Gaglain, who is the leading rusher with 692 yards and the same seven scores. Kalen Blosh was another 7 TD rusher on way less carries, but effective in finding the end zone nonetheless. And then Jake or Jack Black Blusha was the other multiple TD rusher at four in this senior class. 
that overall graduates 26 of the 31 total rushing touchdowns. A trio of Hermosillo, Bloch, and Hernandez spearheaded any receptions, with the three of them going for 300, and Hernandez and Hermosillo both catching three touchdowns apiece. But Damon mobbed on defense as well as special teams, having a ton of return yards, being a threat to take it to the house anytime he caught the ball. But, you know, in the secondary, had six of the team's 12 total interceptions and led in pass deflections at six while recovering two fumbles and racking up 45 tackles. Kevin Hermosillo also had an interception, but was second in total tackles at 75 while destroying the QB three times and ball carriers in the backfield eight other times. Blosh was the leading tackler with 88 and eight of those in the backfield. Cesar Varela was an all-state guy up front, assisting on 52 tackles and forcing three and a half tackles for loss, but mainly opening up a ton of opportunities for ball carriers to, su to succeed in this run-heavy offense. Victor Perez was number three with 58 total tackles and six and a half in the backfield. And then Ethan, his name comes back around here because six tackles for loss was fourth best on the squad, just ahead of fellow senior Ethan Gonzalez's five. Alex Lozano also made plays with three punt blocks and was first team All-State kicker and All-Playmaker status. But man, once you start reading some of these numbers that I have here, this is where the concerns start to come in because as a unit, they lose 84% of their 53 tackles for loss, they graduate 12 of the top 15 tacklers, including numbers 1 through 5, all but one sack from last year, and 27 turnovers graduate. It's just obs... It's second... It's, str it's stressing me out! I'm backing away from my mic because it's stressing me out! They are losing so much. They're losing so much. It's... <sighs> also, shout out to Nash, who had seven fumble recoveries as I start to reclaim my sanity. I just remember, I was just staring at my screen, looking at these numbers, and just sitting here with my mouth open at how, A, legendary this defense was last year, averaging, you know, just a hair under 17 points per game. But just the fact that they were able to force so many turnovers is, uh, there, there's no word to, to describe it other than absurd, ridiculous, ludicrous, insane, insane, really. So they will have their hands full, these returning playmakers here. So let's talk about some of the returning playmakers. Jonathan Thompson is the only player coming back with an interception, but, you know, was kind of a do-it-all guy, a utility player on this defense forcing and recovering a fumble, three and a half stops in the backfield. I want to say over 25 tackles total. Trey Stegman was the leading returning tackler after posting 44 last season and four of those being for loss. And then their offense will primarily run through Silas Baki, who, you know, will be tasked with the offensive load as kind of the Wildcat QB setup. He's got a solid frame at 6'2", 195 pounds to hopefully carry a very intense workload that I think will reflect more of like Clay Robinson's workload from just a couple years ago. And, uh, you know, he was able to throw scores and he ran for 500 yards and five scores and will be the guy for Yuma heading forward. So let's look at their upcoming schedule for the season. Once again, probably just going to be much of the same if I got to be honest. And, you know, that is partially confirmed since they have uh, an away game against Sterling, then Burns, Wyoming, and then banning Lewis, currently listed as their three non-league games. If we fill in the non-league game from last year that they don't have listed, that would be Brush. I think that, you know, if it is Brush, that's a winnable game. I think that banning Lewis Academy... Oh, banning Lewis Academy has kind of been underachieving a little bit. But this one will be in the Springs. But, you know, I will say until banning Lewis Academy shows me for sure, I'm going to give the benefit of the doubt to Yuma here. Uh, because they have proven me wrong before, and it's up to Banning Lewis Academy to prove me wrong now. Looking at Burns out of Wyoming, this was a playoff team last year in 2A football, you know, playing against the likes of Torrington and stuff. I think that this is actually a pretty good team, and one that if Yuma's not careful, they could find themselves on the wrong end of the stick here. 
They didn't record a ton of stats and they were very senior heavy. So Yuma should still win this, but I don't want to just give it to him without, you know, any pressure. And then Sterling, they should definitely win. So I'm saying that Yuma is probably 4-0 heading into league play where they play Wiggins. Definitely a game that they should win. Burlington, that is not a gimme this year. That's a game that they won by 11 last year, but it is not a gimme this year. So I actually think I have Burlington favored in that game if I really think about it. Ray, I just talked about how few returners they're coming back with. So they're in a very similar situation as Yuma, but I think that they're just, they got a little bit more size up front. So I'm going to defer to Ray, but this will be a home game for Yuma. So it's winnable. I think that the games that they probably don't win happen to end their season against Holyoke and Lyman. I just don't see a ton of room for that. So I think bare minimum, even if they lose to a Banning Lewis Academy, even if they lose to Burlington and Ray, I mean, I still think that they should win four games at the least, but I think that they're going to exceed that. I honestly can see them opening up 4-0 or actually scratch that, make that 5-0. and And then, you know, if they split Burlington and Ray, I think that that's a good run there. And so I think that this team probably goes 6-3. and three. Yeah, I'll say that they go 6-3. and three. They aim for that high end, but would not be surprised if they end up at 5-4. and four. Either way, should be a playoff team for this year in a row. I know that the window of wins kind of looks very similar for most of these teams, but... I don't know what to tell you. I can't control that. It's very competitive in this league. And I think that the parity is just going to be way better this year than it was last year for the most part, as just a lot of teams graduated a ton of contributors, to be fair. And with that, that will not only do it for this episode of previews that included, once again, the Estes Park Bobcats, the Middle Park Panthers, the Pinnacle Timberwolves, Strasburg, Burlington Cougars, Holyoke Dragons, Lyman Badgers, Wiggins Tigers, and the Ray Eagles, which some of the best logos in the game. Just going to give this, these leagues a shout out as well as, you know, Estes Park and Pinnacle as well. But, you know, that'll do it for this preview episode as well as my series of previews. But don't let that deter you from continuing to listen as if there are teams missing, which there were plenty, that might be on Gideon's episode coming out on Monday, or it might be on Coach V's season previews coming up, which, you know, in those season previews, once again, we talk about the last year's recap, seniors that graduated in the class of 23, playmakers that are coming back or good additions, whether it be transfers or incoming talent, and we project their season next and so we'll talk about how we did last year as well but for news on all of that be sure to follow us on social media whether that's at playmakers corner on instagram playmakers corner on facebook or at playmaker corner on twitter we're also on tiktok where we post a few season previews as well as clips from some of our other episodes so be sure to find playmakers corner on tiktok as well and for other visual media we are on youtube so go subscribe to us where we post our episodes there as well. And then to listen to any other episodes, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, that's the gist. Make sure to turn on notifications for all of those so that you can stay tuned as we not only continue to preview the 2023 fall Colorado football season in high school, but as we get ready to actually cover it. I've been your host for this set of previews and the opening set of previews, Cody Stoffer signing off for a few weeks since I'm uh, going to be crossing the pond. So if you guys want anything from Europe, let me know. I'm not going to buy it for you, but uh, yeah, go ahead and interact with this post and let me know what I should check out in Europe. But for now, peace.